Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor Henning, for writing this book. It's amazing. It's truly phenomenal. Um, the Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. Uh, this book came from work that you have done for over 25 years, 26 years now, I think. What led you to write this book? And did anything in the current moment um, of, of in the state of the world that we are living in right now, did any of that lead to you kind of putting your thoughts on paper now? Yeah, it's um, a great question. Um, first, even let me just say thank you to uh, Brittany for, for being here and Michael for being here and um, Megan and, and Dion and the whole uh, team for pulling this together, Dean Trainer. Um, this is such a critically important issue, obviously, um, for, for a range of reasons. I will tell you what prompted me to write this book is um, really waking up one day and looking around the courthouse and realizing that I had been representing children in the nation's capital for more than 20 years at that point and had only had four black, I mean, four white clients. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> that should make everyone pause and out of just absolute shock. Four white children in over 20 years and it persists to this day um, and in particular uh, the fact that we live in the nation's capital folks who don't live here might believe that either there are no white children in the city proper <laughs> we know that's not true or that white children don't commit crime and we also know that's just simply not true. Um, and so it's really hard to do this work for a very, very long time and not, to be quite frank, just want to blow up the whole system. <laughs> um, and then if I'm not going to blow up the whole system, then I need to be asking the hard questions. Um, and the hard questions are, are these racial disparities happening all across the country? We know the answer to that one is an easy one, yes. <laughs> um, why are these racial disparities happening? Um, I wanted to know what impact these disparities were having. And I have to say, for me, this is the single most important question. What impact were those racial disparities having on uh, black and brown children? And I mean, developmentally, psycho uh, 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 psychologically, um, emotionally, physically, within their families, within their communities. We have um, I also wanted to know if um, if these racial disparities exist all over the country, are we making the, the country any safer <laughs> by arresting kids, uh, locking them up, uh, running them through the juvenile legal system? And then if the answer to that is no, then what do we do about it? And so that's really what, all, what this book is about. And I will say it wasn't that there are a couple of aha moments um, that happened for me in my career. We may get to them in the conversation. Um, uh, but there wasn't any one day. It was truly, I, I really love how many students are in this space, it, it, being aware, right? We, you know, you get assigned a case as a defense attorney, right? And you do your job. <laughs> your job is to look at the elements and represent the kid in this case. But we, we have to do more than just this case. We have to stop and look what's happening around us. Who's here in the courthouse um, and who's not coming in that front door? And so that's really what happened to me over I, probably a series of aha moments. And so I, I just knew I had to, to put it on paper. Yeah, wonderful. Mr. Plummer, we heard your bio read that Megan um, read to us, you know, mentioned earlier. And she shared that you came home after a couple of decades in prison because of the Incarceration Reduction Amendment Act. So first, welcome home. I'm Thanks. so glad you're back in your community. <laughs> and, you know, we just heard Professor Henning share, right, in her career for white youth. Is that symbolic of what you experienced when you were in prison? Were, did you see other white folks? What were the racial disparities or were there racial disparities in your um, situation? Growing up, I'm a Washingtonian, growing up in Washington, D.C., so you're right. You only, you're not going to see, like, white people or, you know, uh, Chinese in the prison system, the juvenile justice system, even when you transition to the adult system. So in Lorton, you might see maybe five white guys out of a population of over 5,000 um, African Americans. And so um, you, you tend to think, <laughs> do you know, other races commit crimes. But um, it shows that um, these our, our people are targeted um, for for these crimes. 
and is books being written about it, um, Cointel Pro, and you know all these different other books that points to the fact that you know the drugs was put here, the guns was put here um, to destroy our people. And also, we heard that you're you're a mentor in the city, a credible messenger. Can you tell us, tell everybody here, what that looks like and um, what you do as a credible messenger mentor? And also, because you're working with young people, are they talking about race with you? Are they also seeing racial disparities? Credible Messenger Initiative is an initiative that's sponsored by the mayor of the city um, and the deputy mayor under DYRS, the Department of Youth and Rehabilitation Services. And so what this um, organization does, or this government entity, um, is deals with youth, uh, youth, uh, youth in, who got in trouble with the law, justice involved youth. And once they get, before commitment and after commitment, they're assigned a mentor. Generally, these are mentors, not necessarily who have been incarcerated, but who have lived a, a rough life and have experience, turn their life around, and they tend to, you know, get these youth. It's six programs in the city. Some of them have been around for 30 years. Some of them, maybe five. We get the youth. We talk to them. Um, and we generally have a youth for maybe until their commitment is up, whether it's 21 or whether it's three years, whether it's six months. Our job is to cultivate love and, you know, trust. And this transitions to the family as well. So it's really community based, not just the justice involved youth. And when it spreads to the family, then, you know, it spreads to the community and so forth. And our job is to make sure that um, we provide resources to them, wrap around resources, whether it's restorative justice um, or whether just having just a sit down and a talk or whether it's just a hug. But we there to provide a service. Um, and even post-commitment services, after the service is up, we still provide services to them for up to six months or how long it's needed. And Chris, in reading your book, the thing that really stands out is it's not just an academic text. It's not, you know, well, I'm sure these students would be thrilled to read about this in a, maybe a crim law class, but it really tells a bunch of stories. It's uh, narratives and experiences that you've seen firsthand, and it's very compelling that way. Why did you choose to write the book through through that lens? Yeah, um, I, I think a couple of things. One, um, I wanted to give voice to the young people that you work with, right? The young people that I represent in, in my uh, in my clinic with all the Georgetown Juvenile Justice Clinic students, um, and several things. One, particularly as we sit here in a law school classroom and we think, or in a law school environment, and we think about how to bring about systems reform, right? So if we know that there's racial disparity and racial disparity is not making us any safer, right? And is actually doing more harm than good, then what do we do about it? So to get buy-in for our reform agenda, we have to win hearts and minds. <laughs> and I think um, in my experience, uh, data and empirical research doesn't always do the, the job. So what I wanted to do was to write a book in which lawmakers, systems actors, uh, teachers, um, everybody in this room could see themselves in those stories, right? So I remember, I see myself when I was a kid um, and I didn't get arrested or I didn't get penalized or criminalized in this way. So that was really important to me. Or that a parent reading this, uh, a white middle-class parent reading this says, my kid that did that. And I would be mortified if my child were treated you know, uh, in that way. So I really wanted to win hearts and minds through narrative. And I know in, in talking with some of the students before um, this event, just thinking about the role of narrative in the law means a lot. Um, uh, but in addition to that, I do weave together the data and the empirical research, but hopefully in a way that's in plain language so that it's accessible to everyone. Um, so really, it was, a, it was a very intentional decision about, um, uh, about how to bring about reform. Um, and I have to say, we as, a, as a law professors 
I will say for me, I'll speak for myself, you know, really aren't taught to write in that narrative way, right? We're taught to, as Professor Linhart said, dissect cases and, you know, do the analytical framework, which is, which is very important. But I remember writing this book and sharing it with some colleagues, and I was trying to uh, uh, make it plain language. And one of my friends said to me, you know what? You sound like you're a PhD who's trying to be hip. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to just be hip <laughs> and, and, you know, act like you know a little something and so it, it, it's a lot I think it's an intentional effort to think about how to talk about the law and policy um, and social justice in ways that are that are compelling yeah. and mr. Plummer how do you feel about that right in your work you're you're receiving a lot of stories do you think storytelling of the stories behind young people who are system involved do you think that's a helpful way to change hearts and minds it's essential um, a story tells, it gives a depiction of what happened, right? Uh, and we learn lessons from history, right? And when you look back at history, um, you were able to uh, see, paint a picture or graphically see what happened back then. So when you explain to the youth um, what you've been through, right? Um, not necessarily mean that they're going to go through that, but you show the trajectory of the path that you went, uh, it starts to open their eyes up. And when you tell them that you spent decades in prison as a juvenile and you were looking to serve life in prison, they really started to think. And so, you know, as you work with them, as time progress on, uh, they're going to pull you to the side and start asking you questions. That's when you know you got them. Mm. When they start asking them certain questions like, well, how did you cope with this? Because some of them are, you know, unfortunately headed to prison. You know, they headed to the federal system uh, and it's different than being in Lorton, Virginia. So they're going to be around people uh, or inmates from all over the world. And so they asking a lot of questions and they get to thinking, do they want do they want their life to end like this, spending a lifelong in prison, wasting away? And I should just note, I can jump in here, Lorton. So you, you got, you're referring to Lorton. For anybody who doesn't know, that's the, the prison where D.C. residents were sent uh, for years. It's finally closed now. Right. But um, so D.C. doesn't have prisons uh, locally. And so uh, when a, uh, a defendant, adult defendant, gets uh, a prison sentence, they have to leave Washington, D.C. And it used to be closer. It used to be uh, Lorton, Virginia. So I just wanted to share that. Right. So, Chris, let's dig in a little bit into your book. Yeah. Um, so through these stories, there are also themes that we see. And you're using words like dehumanization, criminalization. What what do you mean by that? What does that look like for black youth um, who in the system, in our city? So I think, so when I talk about criminalization and dehumanization, I'm really, I, I, I think we're talking about three broad strokes. So the first one being the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors. That's a huge piece of what this book is about. So again, it's the criminalization of those behaviors that all of us, don't, don't pretend like you didn't, <laughs> but that all of us, you know, experimented in at some point in our childhood. So whether that is, you know, experimenting with drugs and alcohol, getting into a fight with, you know, another student, talking back to a teacher, having a temper tantrum, you know, playing on your cell phone somehow is now criminal, you know, when you're supposed to be um, in class, those kinds of things. It's the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors. And I'm really clear when I talk about uh, criminalization of, of normal adolescent behaviors, it is not only by police officers officers in a blue uniform, but also all of us as civilians, the ways in which we engage with uh, a young black or brown kid and we see we have fear, we have, you know, we perceive them to be a threat. Um, and so we criminalize them. That's the first thing. Those and, and let me also be clear, when I talk about the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors, those uh, activities that should not end up in anybody's courthouse whatsoever. Right. And we, we can come back and, and talk about that um, because truly the vast majority of offenses that actually end up in juvenile court are those normal adolescent behaviors. So we could really shrink the, the size of juvenile court by about 80 percent and leave it down to 20. So that's one whole broad theme. Another one is the the uh, the hyper surveillance and aggressive policing of black and brown youth. And again, policing, I mean, blue uniform as well as 
um, the ways in which all of us are um, hyper surveilling black and brown youth. Um, so that's a huge piece of, of the conversation. Um, and then the third theme uh, under criminalization is about the dehumanizing sentencing, really. It's that back end, right? So young people who do things when they are teenagers, that really are crimes and maybe even have serious outcomes, right? Um, and we know that there are some adolescent behaviors that lead to death even, right? Um, but then the question becomes, how do we respond as a society? How do we uh, rehabilitate? How do we re-engage? And I, I know we'll certainly come back to you know, Mr. Plummer's story. You know, what happens when you actually you know, engage in criminal behavior at the age of 16? You know, how long? <laughs> you know, how do we respond? So those are the three broad themes, I'd say. So looking at the first one, right, when we're talking about criminalizing normal adolescent behavior, in the book you're talking about, you, you provide examples and you have themes that seem to be criminalizing black culture. Right. right. You know, kids wearing their hair a certain way, kids listening to music and being loud and joyous and that being that behavior being criminalized. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I often ask people to think about what did you care about most when you were a teenager? Right. And so it was absolutely the clothes you were wearing, you know, the way your hair was, the friends that you had, the music that you listened to, what you watched on TV. And now we add to that social media. Right. Like who you, you know, you know, OK, TikToking with. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to mess that up. Right? Who are you tweeting? I don't know. Whatever. You write message and you just let it go. Right. Just, Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, how are you engaging with your friends? That's what we cared about then, and that's what they care about now. And so what I talk about in this book is the ways in which those fundamental features of being a teenager are criminalized for a certain segment of our population, right? And so we can take any one of those. Let's take music. Right? So um, we think about country, heavy metal, rock, um, pop music that you know, is uh, full of uh, profane, misogynistic language, um, violent themes, alcohol, drugs, all of it, right? And, it, you know, we accept it, we glorify it, we give it awards. And then, you know, you talk about rap music and hip hop music and you are, black children are treated as if they are the most violent criminals alive because they listen to quote unquote gangster music, right? Like um, when it's all the same themes and folks, when they evaluate uh, black music also are missing the glory and the pride and the politics, you know, of that music. You know, shout out to you know Professor Butler thinking about you know um, uh, the importance of hip hop as a vehicle for social justice. So all of that gets lost, um, and so we criminalize that. Think about clothing, for example. I mean, obviously everybody's thinking immediately. I hope about the hoodie, right? And the ways in which the hoodie has been demonized for for black and brown youth, but even more or black males in particular let's get really you know specific um but even more than that uh thinking about sagging pants it's the only clothing item on the books <laughs> on the criminal books right the only clothing item that people have stood up and said i'm gonna make this a crime a criminal offense um, and when you compare that to you know even the tie-dye t-shirts of the hippie era which was associated with you know uh you know you know using drugs and the like, mm -hmm. or um, the all black attire that young people wore um, with the, you know, the golf uh, era. And even today, right, with the Doc Martens, right, with, you know, red shoelaces that has been associated with the violence of white supremacy. Nobody has outlawed any of that, okay? But we outlaw sagging pants um, in ways that uh, lead to some really, really violent outcomes. Um, and so I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, the hair, the ways in which black girls, um, you know, me in Lux, right? Um, it's very much part of a, a sign of our identity and it really important to us. Um, but yet it's so demonized in so many spaces. Um, and I tell stories about, you know, two girls um, in Massachusetts who were, who, you know, were adopted, two black girls, sisters, were adopted by white uh, parents in Massachusetts. And they began to read about their culture and decided that they wanted extensions in their hair as a part of that uh, identity exploration and literally got suspended, you know, from school and then excluded from all of their extracurricular activities as a result of that. And it goes on and on the number of stories of, of black males and black boys and black girls who have been criminalized or punished or disciplined um, for the way they wear their hair. So these are just examples.
And Mr. Plummer, as you're working with young people, right, setting aside uh, serious offenses for a minute, right, um, have kids shared with you? Have you yourself experienced this kind of criminalization of normal teenage behavior, normal, you know, uh, black culture? Are you seeing that? Are you hearing that from kids you're working with? Sure. Um, truancy, being loud, um, skateboarding. Riding a bike, reckless endangerment on a bicycle, right? These are like these are not crimes, um, but you know they're constantly being targeted with these things. And so once you enter them into this system, right, and they get to you know being around the peers in this group, what you think gonna happen? They're gonna want to stand out. They're gonna want to be acceptable. So they might don't say that I'm in here for truancy. They might say I'm in here for stealing a car, carjacking, right? So what's gonna happen? They fake it till they make it till they become it. And so now, when they go back out, they might come from a good family, but they want to might want to start hanging out with these guys from this corner. Now they ingrained into the streets. You know, now they with this this street gang or crew or whatever, right? And they entrapped and they ensnared. And so when when you talk to them initially, they scared. You know, call my lawyer or you know call my mom. For, they don't want to be in here. They want to be around these guys, but you know. Um, what they going to do, you know? Uh, some of them are scared to death. Some of them, like, hurt themselves, right? You got mental health specialists in there who constantly talking to them, and, you know, they locking them into these rooms, and they never been locked into a room before. So you take a 12-year-old kid or, let's say, 15, who never been locked in a room for a long period of time, the psychological damage that's going to do to them just for this small amount, let's say it's three, four hours. It could be massive. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you saying that because it it it, it shows that young people, right? We're, we're talking about um, young black children, specifically black and brown children, are being almost pushed into these systems deeper and deeper and deeper, and the trauma that's um, that accompanies that. And um, Professor Henning, you talk about that, and you mentioned also this theme of hyper surveillance, over policing, aggressive policing, policing in schools. Can you talk about the trauma that often comes with policing generally? Yeah. So, you know, as I was listening to you talk, I mean, it's just like we criminalize kids for normal adolescent behaviors and we're actually doing so much more harm than good for everybody involved. For, you know, the kids aren't any safer, the uh, public isn't any safer, the officers aren't any safer, precisely because of this trauma. So I write an entire chapter on policing as trauma. And it wasn't until uh, I, I started writing this book that I really understood Understood it, and actually, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll set it up with a story that I opened the policing as trauma chapter with, which is a client that we represented in the juvenile justice clinic. Um, called us one day. It was actually not too long bef before the pandemic. We were sitting in the office, phone rings, and it's our client asking whether or not there was a warrant out for his arrest. And we thought it was such an odd question because we had just been with him in court the day before. Had there been a warrant, you know, the, the police would have, you know, picked him up from the courthouse. Um, and we just couldn't figure out what this was about. We could hear his mother in the background saying, boy, you're just being paranoid. And so we kept asking questions and it turns out that he was sitting in his window um, in, in his living room and looking out and he saw a police car parked in front of his apartment building. And uh, he was convinced that they were waiting for him and that when he walked out that they were gonna arrest him. And so if I tell the story to someone who really doesn't understand, they were like, well, if he's not doing anything wrong, then why is he worried about the police out there waiting for him? And then what I say is, that is because they do not understand how pervasive how pervasive policing and hyper surveillance is in, our, in certain pockets of the, of the country. There are black and brown children um, throughout the country who literally see police officers, not just once a month, not just once a week, but like once a day and sometimes multiple times a day, um, asking them where they're going, where they're coming from, um, some of, sometimes being asked to lift your shirt 
so I can see whether or not you have anything. Uh, yep, a pistol in your waistband. This is just like common practice. It is so common now that like a police car pulls up and a group of, of African-American men and boys automatically lift their shirts without being asked. We should all be traumatized by that, right? Just by hearing that. So then there's the research. So it wasn't until sort of really processing and understanding what that, that client we call Kevin, um, I call Kevin in the book, um, was going through, but the research helps us understand it. There is a growing body of research documenting the extraordinary psychological trauma that black and Latinx children um, uh, experience living in heavily surveilled neighborhoods and being the target of police stops and frisk. The research shows that um, black and brown youth under these circumstances report high rates of fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, they become hypervigilant, meaning that they're literally um, always on guard, right? Um, uh, not trusting the police officers. And what's really problematic is they begin not to trust, uh, that distrust of police officers transfers over to other adult figures like teachers, counselors. Sometimes I you know, say to you know, us as defense attorneys, you know, even to defense attorneys, because they just don't have that sense of trust um, for anyone. What's so powerful about the research is that it shows that this kind of trauma occurs even if you're not the direct target of it, but that you are, um, if you hear about it or you observe it um, among your friends, your family, um, other people that you're close to, or even watching it on the internet, right? Um, thinking about George Floyd, right? Every Everybody, I, I hope, I want to say everybody, but those of us who were traumatized by watching the murder of George Floyd in front, you know, on, on uh, the screen, um, imagine what it's like to be a black or brown child who thinks that could be me tomorrow. It's a much um, even more traumatic experience. So um, there's so much uh, uh, research that supports that. So then in thinking about that trauma and policing and, you know, what we're seeing in the media, what young people are seeing in the media, how does that translate then when police are in schools? What are you seeing there? What is your research showing there? Yeah, I mean, um, there is some really fascinating research about the ways in which literally when a young person walks into the door in so many schools across the country, and I assume most people in this room know that, um, that when you walk in the room uh, at the front door, you are greeted by a police officer in many uh, uh, urban schools, uh, particularly here in the District of Columbia. I, I say that because when I give talks in spaces and other spaces, people are shocked. People are like, oh, wait, kids go to school with police officers. No, black and brown kids <laughs> go to school <laughs> with police officers. Um, and that means, and it looks very much like, I, I think I say in the book, how, you know, when I go to visit uh, a client at school, it looks a whole lot like my visit to the detention facility. You get wanded, you get, you know, searched, you got to empty out your pockets. There's just all this banter between the school resource officer and um, the kids. Um, and so there's just this sense that kids are constantly under surveillance. So much so that there is some really interesting research in which when you do qualitative research with kids and with parents, they actually speak about schools in language that sounds like the criminal justice system. Oh yeah, my son got a charge. A charge? You're in school, right? It's not a charge. Oh, my kid is on probation. You know, um, it's just fascinating to see. And it's not just in urban cities. That one, that particular study about language that parents and kids are using um, was in, you know, in, in a... Uh, a uh, a more rural community. Um, and so it's all over the ways in which black kids are criminalized. Um, there's so much to say about that. I will say, um, I think it's maybe interesting for this crowd. One of the things that I learned while writing the book, I uh, really um, bought into the long repeated narrative that we have police officers in schools because parents and teachers were afraid to send their kids to school after Columbine which was in 1999. But as I did more research, it became clear, and I feel like now, thinking back on it, I should have known this, but that the first police in schools came in 1939 in Indianapolis when there was the first inkling of a conversation about desegregating schools. And then police and schools increase exponentially in the civil rights era, um, especially in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and, you know, we know that 
the police were sent under the guise of facilitating a safe integration of schools, but the reality is more often than not, they were an impediment to full and meaningful integration. And then in 1991, a full eight years prior to, to Columbine, we have the creation of the National Association of School Resource Officers. That's a full fleet of police officers in schools such that they need training um, and a national organization. Um, 1994, the so last da data point I'll give you, 1994, we have the federal cops and school framework is created. That is the framework that was created to funnel money into, the, uh, uh, into policing in schools. What's happening in the 1990s? You see, I'm a law professor. I want to ask the audience. <laughs> you know, the 1990s is that temporary uptick in crime. It is the heart of the super predator myth. Right. So all of this happens before Columbine. Right. Um, and so Columbine uh, comes in 1999. And sure enough, the federal government begins to funnel money into the already created federal cops and schools framework. And where do the police officers get sent? They get sent to the schools with a predominantly African-American and Latinx community, um, not into the, the, the Columbines and the Sandy Hooks and, uh, and the like. So, it, so the cops and schools is very much, has a very uh, racialized history. And we know more cops in schools means more arrest in schools, more arrest in schools means more arrest of black and brown children in schools. Yeah. So you were talking about this kind of super predator myth. So thinking about that was over 20 years ago now. And Mr. Plummer, you know, over 20 years ago now is when you entered prison. Um, do you mind, right, sharing your story with us and the panel here as to what that looked like and, you know, how did you return home to your community after so long? Thank goodness for the incarceration and uh, reduction of MNF. Right. Uh, I just want to, you know, add to what she said. Um, we got a program that the Mayor instituted called Safe Passage. So this is a program where um, credible messages go out and go into the schools and outside of schools for entry and when the um, students leave. So I went to Friendship Monday, there were cops there inside the school. I went to Two Rivers today, there were no cops. The, the reason why Friendship, predominantly black, um, Two Rivers mixed. I didn't see one cop in a mile radius except, you know, up the street where, you know, they doing stuff, but not inside the school. So we was introduced to Officer Friendly um, and Friendship, and then we was introduced <laughs> to the principal at mm. Two Rivers. So just to add to that. Um, and can I, just on that point then, um, I think it's great to hear, though, that you as a credible messenger coming to the school to be a response, right? Is right. that an alternative, right? If, if it's if the only word, alternative. Instead of officer friendlies, right. why not turn to the community, turn to credible messengers to provide support? Right. So um, they wanted us to put these vests on and have walkie talkies, right? I say, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to introduce us to the officer and the school security. I say, that's not going to work. We can do this behind closed doors just for communication purposes to know that we're stationed out there. But just imagine if we outside on a crosswalk and I got this yellow vest on with this walkie talkie squawking and the kids walking <laughs> past and I say how you doing the first they gonna look they're not gonna say nothing right so um it's, it's it's difficult to to really reach them anyway right but you know once you see them standing out there and how you doing son and how you doing man well, oh I like your shoes you know just open up to them and you know they're gonna see safe passage on your hat and your sweater it's an opening good for you um, but, you know, as far as my story, um, you would think that it's, it's typical in the inner city. Um, grew up in an impoverished home. Um, and the super predator, I was a part of that um, law uh, where, you know, um, the established power spoke about these youth, um, as they said, hopped up on crack and creating these crimes. Right? I never smoked a crack, but this was stated um, in the address of these crimes. And so in uh, 96, I committed murder. Uh, I was 16. And like six months later, I was uh, captured, had two trials, went to prison. And I'm just thinking, okay, maybe I might get a uh, juvenile life and go down Oak Hill, uh, where they enacted a law called the Title 16. And Title 16, which is, it, it transitions you from a youth to an adult automatically. 
without any mitigating factors. They didn't know if I was insane. They didn't know nothing about me. They just said, you know what? You committed murder. This is an adult act. I'm going to do away with you. The same sentence that I was given was the same sentence that would have been given to an adult who was 35 or 50, who may have committed 100 crimes. But I committed one crime, and they said that I'm irredeemable. So I went to prison. I could barely read. And um, the transition was horrific. My first um, day um, in the actual prison, or the first week, rather, somebody was murdered. 18-year-old kid in a supermax prison. They sent me to supermax. They didn't even put me in a transitional prison to, you know, funnel me in. They just threw me right in the lions, then just get in there and, you know, find your way around. And the first thing that happened was a murder happened. I was scared. Um, and once Lorton closed, they transitioned us to the, the, uh, the Virginia system. From there, we went to the federal system. Um, and you see so much abuse there. And I think it was spoken about like PTSD. Um, if I hear a chair move, I hear some arguing um, or like some keys rattling, I'm automatically hypervision. Like, you know, I'm automatically thinking the CO is about to come um, when an officer gets behind me in a squad car. And I haven't been pulled over since I've been home. Um, probably because I'm a good driver. I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping that. Um, but, you know, automatically I get to thinking if he pull me over and he run my name, what's going to pop up in the system? So when we look at um, an individual who committed a criminal act, are we irredeemable? Uh, is society looking at us as irredeemable people? Have others not committed crime uh, outside of the African-American community or the brown community and been deemed fit to come back to society or not even go to jail? Rehabilitate them. What the, the IRA Act did was um, it went back and looked at the mitigating factors of what happened before we committed the crime, how we was raised, what we went through. And they found out that, oh, man, this, these kids, man, they didn't, they didn't have a fighting chance. Some of them didn't have parents. I didn't have parents, right? Um, and so even though I had relatives, um, they was just committing an act of, I guess, generosity, you know, or pity, right? Um, it was no one to take me in and say, okay, well, you know, let's help Michael out and his brother. And so for society to look at a group of people and just, you know, throw them away, then this is not right because we boast to the world that we are progressive in our thinking. We are progressive in, in life, technology and spreading love. And then in our own country, you know, we brutalizing, you know, a people. Right. We look at the Jews. Uh, everybody is so sympathetic to the Jewish people and they should be. But when we look at slavery for the African-Americans who millions, tens of hundreds of millions died on them ships coming over here. We turn a blind eye to it. I, I want to say that I know you are redeemable. There are so many young people in the district that know you are redeemable. You have changed lives of my clients who have been blessed to work with you. So I am just so glad you are home and able to show, share your story with all of us here. Um, <laughs> Professor Henning, in hearing, hearing this, right, when we are talking about the more serious offenses, can you provide a little um, historical context as to how race interplays with this and and what kinds of reform should occur when we're talking about the more serious charges with young folks yeah i mean and so i mean we should just pick back up where the the super predator air for you know anybody who's just not clear uh, about what what that's about and um the historical trajectory which starts way before then but at least we'll pick it up there <laughs> right um but the historical trajectory from the, the 1990s to what we have now, which allows for the, tr the, the, the trial of children um, as adults. And so in the 1990s, there was indeed this uptick in, in crime. And it was a temporary uptick, but as a result, um, there were a lot of theories and myths about what, uh, what was happening. One of the most prominent theories was put forth by a professor, uh, Princeton professor John DiUlio, um, who said, who coined this phrase, the super predator. And he d uh, declared, <laughs> um, and all of the uh, politicians and, and uh, 
lawmakers bought into it, which was this idea that African-American children, <laughs> explicitly black children, were going to run amok <laughs> and rape, maim and kill all of America. You know, that was essentially the myth. Um, and as a result, as a direct result of that uh, myth and the language um, that was perpetuated, all of the fear mongering that came with it, virtually every single state in this country um, revised their laws to make it easier to transfer children and try children as adults. So either by um, making it easier to try children at younger ages for more crimes, facing mandatory sentences um, uh, uh, and the like. And so, so many children today, even when the myth within one year was debunked, <laughs> even when Princeton professor John DiUlio himself recanted and realized that he was wrong, the laws, the, the, all of it, the fear mongering, um, it, it was far too late. People on the left and the right took out newspaper ads <laughs> um, about the, the dangers and the fears of, of, of black children. Um, and so our laws were changed. And I got to tell you all, it is almost un impossible to undo <laughs> that kind of legislation. So talk about, you know, what, what changes hearts and minds? It's fear, <laughs> right? So part of this book and part of you talk about, you know, what do we do is, is switching that narrative. Um, we now, this is what's so fascinating um, about the IRA, um, is that it is based on what we know now, which is there's a also growing body of research um, teaching us about the adolescent brain and teaching us about developmental psychology which teaches us, in fact, that um, children are redeemable, right? That a 16-year-old's brain is still forming. In fact, 60, the, an adolescent brain or the, the brain is still forming actually until the early 20s, right? Fact. Just really, right? Um, so much later than, than previously thought. So several things uh, we know now are that uh, because young people are so uh, influenced and impacted by their environment. You talk about growing up you know, in poverty without um, parents, that young people, one, are less culpable, should be deemed within the framework of the law as less culpable as a result of the facts that um, their brains are still developing um, and the like. Also, that young people are heavily influenced by their peers, right? Um, and that changes over time. People naturally desist from crime from their adolescent years into their adult years, even for serious violent offenders, even for a murder, right? Um, people find that really, really hard to believe, but the research shows that. Um, and then, you know, that gets to the, the last piece, which is that um, this amenability to rehabilitation, right? That's why uh, young people should not be subject to extremely long sentences. Um, and that what we should be doing is thinking about a public health approach to public safety so that young people don't end up engaging in criminal behavior in the first place. But a public health approach to safe, uh, safety, you know, includes enhancement, increases in mental health supports, um, vocational opportunities, you know, counseling, um, uh, you know, you talk about credible messengers and violence interrupters. We do far better with young people than locking them up with an adult, putting a 16 year old who is terrified into a prison. And then you expect him to come out. Right. <laughs> you know, somehow changed. Thank you for you for, for, for doing so. But we it's I mean, it's unrealistic to expect that young people are going to change when they have to go into the facility and fend for themselves. <laughs> Um, and the trauma is real. We think about Khalif Browder, you know, spending three years, you know, much of which is in solitary confinement. We think about um, boys and girls being subject to physical abuse by other inmates, by staff, sexual abuse, um, both boys and girls in, in adult facilities, lack of educational opportunities. Um, it's, just, it's an unrealistic uh, expectation that we're going to do anything um, uh, meaningful about public safety in those strategies. Plus, the humanity of, you know, this beautiful, wonderful, you know, Michael Palmer sitting here with us, being able to gauge. And we've talked before, you know, about ways in which you are, um, you know, remorseful and thoughtful about, you know, victims that were impacted, right? That that comes, though, from social emotional learning, from restorative justice, from uh, engaging in conversations with 
with, with young people in safe and meaningful ways, but not sending them to prisons for extreme um, uh, sentences. Um, I will say one more thing, because I think this is a really important point, and that is the contrast between Kyle Rittenhouse and Michael Plummer. Right. And I think this is a really important point. Actually, I wasn't going to go there, but I am going to go there because I think about um, um, when we think about adolescent behaviors and the quintessential key features of adolescence, impulsivity, um, sensation seeking, um, amenability, you know, like or, or, uh, following your peers, doing what your friends are doing in the community. Um, all of those things that we know about adolescence. Right. If we think about Cal Rittenhouse's case. It is a quintessential, it starts off as a quintessential adolescent behavior, right? He's a 17-year-old who crosses state lines with a, uh, a weapon <laughs> wrapped across his chest, <laughs> right? Walking uh, in public, in front of officers, by the way, who don't stop him, right? Why does he do that? <laughs> he's impulsive, he's reactive. His friends called him and says, come this way, right? They actually have bought the gum for him and he's and, and waiting for him. Right. And give him the gun and they go about. And what happens? He then says he gets into this, this situation. Right. Which he has no experience, no skill in navigating. And his adolescent behavior puts him in a situation where he finds that he needs to defend himself. And here's what's really key is that what happens then is that he, his mother and his lawyer, rightfully so, want the whole world to see him as an adolescent. And everyone agreed. Right. That this is a kid who gets himself into this situation. And what happens to him? He gets due process. <laughs> right. He gets found not guilty and he goes about his way. He's killed two people. All right. Killed two people. And um, he has severely injured another one. And so you think about the life circumstances looks different than Michael Plummer's situation. But it both grew out of that adolescence. Right. Those key features of adolescence that lead us to engage in behaviors that have really bad outcomes. And so when I talk about adolescent development, I talk a lot about criminalizing normal adolescent behaviors. But I also talk about serious violent offenses, robberies, burglaries, even some sexual assaults that start as adolescents, right? Um, but that have really, really, really bad outcomes. Um, but yet, when it's a white uh, person, they get due process, they get you know a, a opportunity to be heard, um, and uh, they, they get the benefit, what we call the mitigating benefits of adolescence. Adolescence is a privilege um, that, that they get and that black children don't get. And we want to separate out. We want to say that Michael, uh, I'm sorry, that um, Kyle Rittenhouse's behavior is radically different. Than, um, than, than Michael Plummer's, but it's the same rooted in the same uh, pulls and draws that led to that, that incident. And arguably, I would say both are redeemable, right? Both of them are redeemable. Kyle Rittenhouse, people believe he's free to go about <laughs> um, and not, you know, people aren't worried about him. Um, so compare that to, Kyle, to uh, Tamir Rice, who gets shot dead in less than three seconds for also having and not killing him. Well, Chris, I'm glad you did go there. Um, <laughs> that was a really, really, I think, astute point, and thank you. I could sit here for hours and hours and hours and talk to you both and ask more questions, but it seems only fair that the audience has an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so I, I think Tressa here is going to get us started. One of our juvenile justice clinic students. <laughs> for such an engaging discussion. This was really fantastic. I would like to, so we're gonna turn it over to the audience. Um, we've got mic runners. Um, so if you have a question, raise your hand. If you're on the webinar, we're gonna attempt to transfer those questions to me to report them back if you have them. Um, and while we're getting that all set up, I'd like to start us off with a question. Um, and I would personally um, like to start with a question that we didn't quite get to. Um, and that is, I know we talked, you all talked about um, kind of policing as trauma, how the media is involved. We touched on the community a little bit. I'd love to sort of specify the focus. Um, Mr. Plummer, you specifically mentioned involving the family. So I'd like to talk about how this criminalization of youth um, really affects the whole family. How does it affect parents, siblings, what your experience has been, and, and Professor Henning, what, what you see as well? You want to start? Yeah. Um, so... I'm dealing with a family right now, and the mother has four boys. And with these four boys, she's the only parent. And once one son got arrested, she had to stop from working. 
So now she can't work. She relies heavily on uh, government assistance. And, you know, one, one family member throws the whole family out of whack. So the parents become, you know, or the family becomes, you know, imprisoned as well um, to the prosecutor, the judge, or DYRS, right? And they always say, oh, well, I'm not locked up, you know, and the youth is. So um, it hurts the community as well because the only alternative is let's just lock them up and send them away. And that's not the only alternative um, to say that um, we got to come up with an alternative, uh, send them to prison. We do. Um, and, and it's not an easy discussion, and it, and it won't happen probably in a week, but it got to be done. So I would add to that by saying that there are tons of books written about the, um, the impact of parental incarceration on children and virtually no books written about the impacts of uh, incarceration of children on the whole family, the whole ecosystem. And I, um, uh, I you know, you will read the book and you will see that my brother uh, was in prison <laughs> um, and, and unfortunately died in prison. And I really began to think about um, the ways in which incarceration of an adolescent impacts siblings, right? So it impacts parents and impacts siblings and how incredibly, it's even difficult to talk about, but how incredibly painful that is on so many different levels, right? So the range of emotions, for example, that uh, a, a sibling goes through, um, everything from, you know, t being terrified of the physical violence that your sibling may incur in you know with the police or in a facility the the loneliness the lack of companionship the and to be quite frank sometimes the embarrassment well what will everyone think right and will i get labeled because my brother was you know in prison if everybody gonna assume the same for me um and so there's been very little research but some of the research that's been done has been done by journalists and a lot of people talk about that how if you grow up and one of your siblings is in the facility then the police from your neighborhood the teachers from your neighborhood, the principals, everybody assumes that you're going to follow those tracks, right? And that's, you know, really, you know, it's, re it's really devastating. And then what you describe, we absolutely see in our cases, family members who have to give up their jobs because they keep missing, uh, uh, I mean, missing they work, right, to go to court hearings or, um, or, or, or what have you. And then now with what we have in, in D.C. and a lot of cities do, parental participation laws, which actually make it, you know, uh, uh, a requirement that a parent must come to every single court hearing. And we want that, but like to make it such that there's no way out when, particularly in a single family where there's no other, uh, you know, uh, somebody's got to work. Mm. And so that's just a, a couple of examples. Yeah. yeah thank you. I, I think it's super important. And like you said, we see it with, um, especially it's even more, I think, pervasive now because courts on Zoom, so right. we're inside people's homes. I think oh, that's right. Magnified. That's and really good, Tressa. Yes. I don't want to talk, though. Are there, are there no? questions out? I can ask more, but it's not about me. <laughs> we have some. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. There, this mic is coming to you. All right, so I have a question for Mr. Plummer. Uh, it's a two-part question. At what point in your incarceration did you personally feel that you were rehabilitated? And at what point did you encounter a genuine remorse for your actions? And did those occur simultaneously or at different times? Right. So the second part, uh, immediately, after I committed the act, I, I, I knew that this was a, a wrong thing to do. Uh, and this is a super question. And so um, I want to say I was 23. And um, I had stopped smoking marijuana and, you know, cigarettes. And, you know, I started to cleanse my body and take reading more seriously. And as, as I started to read more, it opened my mind up to different things, different cultures and stuff like that. And so um, that's when I made a conscious effort to change. I want to say around 23, 25. It didn't take um, 30 years or 23 years, but this was, um, uh, what I say, um, self-inflicted. I wanted to change myself, right? It was no program set up in prison mm -hmm that took me down that path for uh, re redemption or to change my life, right? Their, their whole goal is to house you. Anything that a person does in there is what they want to do. And so I want to say in my early 20s.
and upon, um, you know, um, finding a, uh, a, a spiritual compass. Good question. We've got a question here. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Do you mind sharing a bit about that spiritual compass that you got? Right. Uh, so I'm Muslim, um, as you noticed, and um, I was raised uh, Christian. But uh, I want to say um, once I got found guilty, that's when I said I got to change my life. So I started going to church, and I didn't want to narrow it down to church. So I went to re the religious groups that they had uh, available at the prison. And I went to all of them, and I had all these people, you know, pulling at me, hey, come be Jewish, and, you know, come be uh, more science and stuff like that. And so I began reading their books and see um, on Hinduism and stuff like that. And this lamb sat right with me, right, um, the meaning of peace and submission, and, you know, um, knowing that the creator has control of everything. And so once I realized that, um, I, I loved it, and, you know, from the outside looking in, outside of the rhetoric, uh, you know, jihadists and all this old type of stuff. If you look at the root word of Islam, Salama, right? It means to submit, you know, peace and so forth. So uh, it's, it's a religion um, that I can relate to uh, as a human being. And it helped me out, you know, personally. It helped my, my growth and my maturity. Thank you. I think we had a question. Um, the first question or the prior question made me think of this. In what ways did prison impede any, you know, first of all, you know, that, did you feel like you needed to be rehabilitated? And in what ways did prison impede that? Were there any ways it helped? And, and um, to Professor Henning, you know, what have you seen your clients? I'm sure you've worked with clients who've been in a long time. You know, what, what are the stories that, what did they tell? Like, can, could we ever make prison truly rehabilitative and, and beneficial? Well, that's an I know, question. right? <laughs> I like it, though. It's, it, it, it's, it is a good question. It, it, it's, it's, it's contextual. So um, I'm going to say it was needed because I didn't have guidance. Um, and I got a GED. I got a college degree while I was there. So I look at it as, as, as my university, right? I use it to better myself. Now, the mandatory minimum, that's why I think it got shaky at. Could I have been sent to um, a residential and um, talk to psychologists or, you know, mentors there. And could that have prevented me from uh, um, doing all that time in prison, right? Uh, I don't look at my time as being wasted there because I looked at my legacy uh, for my daughter and what I wanted my legacy to be if I passed away in prison, right? Um, um, and so I used to write to her about things, you know, me. And then I read about, you know, other uh, prolific figures that went to prison. Martin Luther King, you got Malcolm X and... You know, all these great figures that went to prison and when they came out, what they did. So that's how I looked at it. Uh, prison is needed for some people. I'm not going to say that it's not necessary. Um, you got some people that commit crimes and some people that are sick. Um, and I think it's our job to get down to the bottom of who these people are, assess them and get them the proper help. And once the proper help is given to them, then we can we can move on. But we can shut down all these prisons because from the mandatory minimum, when they came out with this super predator, they did a 30 year study and it showed that these lengthy sentences did not stop crime. It did not stop them. They just coming up with this stuff. I think to put uh, prisons in these Roy worries to give farmers somewhere to work. And I'm not trying, I'm not trying to be funny or nothing, but like you look at some of these areas where they put these prisons at, there's nothing there. So is this a money marketing scheme for you to divert your portfolio? I don't know. But uh, it's, it's not working because when you go into an actual prison, you go to the law library, you go to the school, it's, it's like it's like a, a cubby hole. But the gymnasium is big, the yard is big, you know, the books are just on the shelves, gathering dust. They took the pill, ran away. So uh, it's definitely necessary, uh, but to some, to, we must diminish the length in prison uh, for the crimes that's being, you know, um, taking place. So what I love about uh, your response is, so it allows for healthy debate, right? <laughs> um, and it's such a, it's a, it's a nuanced answer. And we've talked about this a bit in advance of, of uh, um, our, our conversation, which is, so I would say, 
Um, one, remember what I said earlier, we could shrink the size of the system, first of all, by at least 80 percent, particularly when we're talking about young people. And so then we're left with that last 20 percent or, or maybe it's even less. Ideally, it's less. It's a really small percentage, particularly of teenagers, of young people who are committing the kinds of crimes that we're most afraid of. Right. Murder, rape, um, uh, uh, robberies with serious violence um, and the like. So what do we do with those 20 percent? So what I hear you're saying, which I like as a nuanced answer, is like, I'm not going to take, I, I, you took advantage of the opportunity that was presented, which was prison. Right. My take on it is what you also alluded to, if somebody would give me those same opportunities, right, those same rehabilitative responses, a, a, uh, a safe place to go and study uh, um, and, and get, a, you know, get an education, um, if I could have those rehabilitative supports and interventions. And I got to tell you, there are evidence-based programs, right, that uh, have been proven to work even with serious repeat violent offenders, right? Um, there's a, a, a website called like blueprints.com, uh, um, which specifically talks about the range of different services and programs, um, including things like you know, multi-systemic therapy, family functional therapy. There's these really comprehensive wraparound interventions that can be done. Um, and so I'm not, so, you know, look, I don't even want to get into a debate about abolition of prison versus not, but um, if we all agree that there's a small percentage of people who are engaged in those serious crime, we can think about how, how, to, how to engage equitably, right? Um, and effectively, those are the questions. I'm not as convinced that I need prison to do that, okay? And that if we were investing also on the front end, right, all the social ills that we know, um, if we were investing in that, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have, you know, uh, a Michael who finds himself in a situation where there's a murder, right? Like, I think that's what's, what's really important. So that I want to believe I don't know that happened in my life, but, but like, I want to believe that there is a world in which we don't have to have prisons to deal with that, right? But I do believe in, you know, uh, you know, victims, you know, you know, voices. I believe in, um, you know, accountability, but accountability for a young person, right, at 16 looks different, <laughs> yeah. you know, than an accountability for. A 50 year old or but the other thing one other thing I heard you say also too is like when people go into prisons and we're figuring out like whether they're sick or what have you but can we figure that out first like if you're sick what does sick mean like mentally you know do I have some uh, 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 mental health challenges and if so we need to take care of that so that they don't we don't use our prison system to to address folks who are mentally ill. No, I think I think we agree though. I agree yeah, we with do that. Agree. Like especially the youth. I'm talking about like the, the the adult. Yeah. Like you take Hinkley. They sent Mr. Hinkley over uh what's that um St. E's. Right. 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 You know, you shoot a president, right? You go you go to St. E's and then you get to walk free every day, right? Um but then a kid who, you know, commits a perpetuous act, you know, out of you know, he he was scared or maybe he was mentally ill, uh, you send him away from prison forever. So, uh, no, I, I definitely agree with you. I don't think that, you know, because, you know, prisons, they, they, some things happen in prison that society don't know that you were cringe about. The officers, the staff, they know that these things are happening. Uh, it's a buddy system. I get into it with her. You know, I curse her out. Her brother works there. So she tell her brother, Michael, curse me out. And I come in, he shake my cell down, they find a knife in there. I didn't have no knife. So who is the adjustment board going to believe? The inmate or the staff member. The first thing, they, my staff member not going to lie. Right. You, you, you'll be surprised at the things that happen in this prison. So the justice system definitely needs to over. I agree with that. I, we're not in disagreement with that. <laughs> I didn't mean to like, change right now. No, 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 no. I agree with that. We may blow it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have a question here. Yeah. So I know you just said you don't want to get into the abolition debate, so I'll try to phrase this in a way that... <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, so it feels like the goal of American society under, like, let's say, capitalism is to produce productive citizens, and so I'm wondering your opinions on why we're so hesitant to funnel youth into programs that produce productive adults <laughs> rather than programs that, like, quite literally, as, as Michael was saying, like what people think you are and so I'm wondering like yeah. why there is that hesitance or that refusal or why you think why you think yeah that. and that's for both of you to answer 
I mean, it's a downright refusal. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'll be honest, this is really, you've gotten to the heart of the, of the debate. So sometimes I'll be honest with you all, because um, I think this is just a really useful space about transforming systems and systems reform. Um, I do a lot of, 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 of conversations or talks and presentations with police officers, prosecutors, um, lawmakers who are worried and who are reluctant to make the kinds of changes that like abolition and defund the police and, you know, all of that. And, and you know, look. I want change, so I don't want to get into the inflammatory. But what, right? And that, that's so. It's, it's a. I'm being transparent. It's a. Um, it's a, a strategic approach to achieve change. Um, language matters to people. But here's here's the thing. You have to understand, like the root of why there is so much resistance is the fear narrative. It is that is part of why um, I think like conversations that we're having are so incredibly important. It is to change the narrative to get the country to see black and brown children as children. The reason why people are reluctant to send a child to a program, as you said, to make them a more productive citizen is because they've grown up terrified of black and brown children. Literally, it is the, they are the demon. Um, and I'll be very honest with you, it is not just, it is, it is within the same race, right? Um, I had a, a wonderful conversation today with um, uh, an African-American woman, you know, who's a community organizer who is struggling with this, this issue. And they invited me to come speak. And so we were talking about it. And I knew, I know her reputation. She's sort of a driver on public safety and, you know, she's, you know, getting the police out. And I literally said to her, I just stopped her in the middle of the conversation. Why are you inviting me? You know what my agenda is. My agenda, she's like, I know. <laughs> and she says, and she, it was so beautiful. She says, because we're so conflicted. As a black community, even struggling with these issues, we want safety. We don't want the kids selling drugs on our corner. We don't want, you know, shootings in our neighborhood. But at the same time, we want our kids to be kids and to be able to be kids and to not be over policed. Um, but there is this fear narrative. And so what I what I part of the narrative shift it goes back to your question is getting folks to see that you can't police all black children. Um, when one or two or a very small percentage of, of children in our country are, are engaging in criminal behavior. So I think it, it's, it's a narrative that, they're, that black children are irredeemable um, and that they are to be feared and that there is no hope for them to do well. And so, you know, you would, uh, you know, I, I say all the time that um, a psychologist friend taught me every single child needs one irrationally caring adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a child does better off if they have a team of irrationally caring adults. And we're not willing to do that for black children because we don't believe that they're children. I know that sounds oversimplified, but that's, that's really, it's, it's the heart of what it is. It really is. Uh, I would say, like, I think it's monetary-wise, too, though, right? Like, it's big money in, yeah. in, in, in the prison industry. I, I want to say 2015, maybe 16, CNN did a study on, on this. Um, and I think it's like 360 billion is allotted to this criminal justice, like you know, with the with the with the prisons make down to with the CO, uh, the correctional officer payments and the probation and the po the, the police force, um, the prosecutors, the lawyers, right? It, it's it's a big money racket. So um, they asked the guy, you got a diverse portfolio. He said, what if I tell you that you got stock? He said, how you feel about prison? I don't like it. This and, you know, and so he say, what if I tell you got stock in what I think is an American corporation, ACC, uh, whatever it is. Right. Um, and oh, yeah. yeah, this dude got stock in there. He say, what? He said, oh, you know, I'm closing my account and talking to my broker. So people are uh, actually invested in prisons who don't even like for people to go to prison. It's, it's big money in this stuff. You got the bail bonds, man. You got all these guys. And, you know, so it's a big money racket. So why would you stop the money from flowing into the coffers? Yeah. Thank you. I would love to keep asking y'all questions. I think we have to unfortunately wrap it up. So I will invite Dion up for some closing remarks. Could we get Dean oh. Bellamy, though? Yeah. Like, I just need to be in a room with that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, thank you so much for fitting me in. <laughs> Uh, As I hijack it from trust, I apologize. <laughs> and Chris Henning, thank you for this book. The country <laughs> needs it. It is needed so much. And I hope people read it and make a difference with it, use it to make a difference. Uh, back in the 1980s and 90s, Georgetown Law Center's street law program had a corrections 
aspect to it. Yes. Now they only have the high school, but they right. did have a corrections. And they, would have, they had a program at Lorton where they would train, I mean, teach uh, inmates basic aspects of American law and know their rights and so forth. And at the end of the program, they would have a graduation ceremony for the, for the uh, members who completed the, the course. And I would be asked to go to Lorton to give what was called a graduation speech to the inmates. I'm going to tell you, when I walked into that prison each time and I saw a sea of black and brown faces, young men, hundreds if not thousands, it just was mind blowing. It was just unbelievable. And the problem we have is that these prisons are out of sight and out of mind. I think if the average American walked into a prison and spent one hour in this prison, yep. they will be on the side of doing what you said. 80% can be eliminated and, and do find other alternative means of dealing with these issues. But it's just amazing that all these black and brown men are locked up and they start as that adolescents can, and get caught in the prison system and then are being adults incarcerated. Yeah. So thank you, Professor. Thank you. I promise you I did not you know, call on him because he was going to say that. Because <laughs> he was going to affirm all you. their points. <laughs> but no, it's absolutely right. It, it's just, it's been such a long standing and pervasive uh, problem. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. So for, I will just say this as folks as we wrap up, just, you know, folks who are interested in these issues, you know, we don't like, yeah, uh, street law is still wonderful to get engaged with because you're in the high schools, which is the new prisons, right? Um, the juvenile justice clinic, you know, the, um, you know, you were with the, the Georgetown Scholars, which is over on Main campus. I'm alumni. Alumni at the Georgetown <laughs> Scholars Program with Mark Howard. Um, so there's a lot of, of work happening at Georgetown Law School, a lot of ways to engage around these issues. Um, so I just, uh, you know, shout out to Georgetown's um, uh, Institute on Poverty and Inequality. I know, uh, I think I saw uh, Peter Edelman uh, here was here earlier. There are ways to get engaged around um, some of these critical issues. So, Thank you all so much. I will invite